Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can remain connected better with friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. I lost him first to his hearing loss from the radiation to his brain tumor, and then again to complications from the brain tumor. I am I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and care for many more with hearing loss. I am the founder of the List Hearing Center. I'm the author of a book of the same title, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to www.listenuphearing.com. Today, I'm excited to have a great guest and a friend of mine. That's Donna Sorkin. We've known each other for a very long time. Donna is a, has been instrumental in the advocacy for hearing loss. Um, she is currently the executive director of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. She's also been the executive director of AG Bell and HLAA. Those are the two major advocacy groups for hearing people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, she uh, also speaks herself firsthand because she has a hearing impairment, and she talks about the extraordinary power of evolving technology. She's a great advocate, and today we're going to talk about the status of uh, the world of cochlear implants and advocacy. Donna, it's so great to see you. It's been a while. I was just saying in the warm-up, you know, you and I uh, went around the uh, Arizona State House in 2008-ish, and then I believe we went to the U.S. Congress, too, at the same time to advocate for cochlear implant coverage. So it's been a long time, but it's great to see you, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be with you, Mark, and to have this opportunity to reach a broad audience. So thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. I mean, you're 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 you've been excellent and instrumental, really working hard in this space. I know you have a your your hearing impaired. That how did you go from being a patient to being an advocate? Like what was your pathway into the more advocacy side, besides perhaps advocating for yourself? Honestly, they both happened at the same time. I I I like to tell people I did three extraordinary things at the same time. I had a cochlear implant. I became the executive director of what used to be called SHHH, but it is now Hearing Loss Association of America. And we built a house. So those were the three things I did at the same time. And honestly, when I um, was exploring taking on the uh, the role of the executive director of the Adult Hearing Loss Association, uh, organization, I was at the same time getting a cochlear implant. So that was a long time ago. That was nice. Still live in the house? <laughs> we, we, the house was being built. <laughs> you still live in it? Yes, we do. We That's still live. You built out in multiple houses still. The house of the HLA, which you helped build. <laughs> in your own personal hearing house, you built them all and they're all still standing. That's awesome. <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> That's a lot. That is a lot. It was, it was a lot. I was young and foolish and took on too much at the same time. But, you know, getting a cochlear implant really helped me negotiate the world. And I'd like to say that it was having that access to the really great sound that a cochlear implant provides that enabled me to be the advocate that I am. So I don't think I could have done it without having the hearing, without having gone through that experience myself and also honestly from having witnessed it in my own family because I come from a family of people that had hearing loss that did not have the options that I had. Right. My father retired um, from his job at age 52 because he couldn't do his work anymore and that was before the ADA when we recognized that we could provide people with accommodations to keep working and my grandmother um, who used just, you know, terrible technology, I'm sure, um, was so isolated. And, you know, she we really couldn't talk to her. She wore these big, bulky hearing aids, analog hearing aids. I'm, I, I don't know what her audiogram was. I, I know what my father's was. Um, but I saw that, that isolation that occurred um, as people aged, as I had nearly normal hearing as a child. 
Um, and then my hearing changed very rapidly. So for me, the, the two went hand in hand. Getting a cochlear implant was what enabled me to become an advocate. And I feel very fortunate to have had that, that opportunity to serve in the way that I have. Yeah, and that speaks wonderfully of, of the uh, impact of the technology and what how much it more enables people who are so capable in terms of doing great things. Yeah, that's really true. And, you know, the other thing about cochlear implants that I think people often don't realize um, is we hear so often that people say they're waiting for the technology to improve. So I have had the same internal device since 1992. And next month I will receive my seventh sound processor. So I keep upgrading on the outside and have seen each time I've upgraded, there is something about the hearing that then improves, whether it's, you know, the ability to talk on the phone, to use Bluetooth, to hear a noise, to hear a distance, um, you know, a whole range of opportunities that the technology has provided me me with as it improved. And you know what, that's true for all of the technologies. We have right now in the United States, three different brands of cochlear implants that are um, in use uh, in the US and they all have followed that pattern. They all have improved their external technologies that have enabled people to have better and better access. So there's no reason to wait. You can, you can have the surgery now, you can continue to improve and benefit from what's going on with the changes that occur. Yeah, when I was doing my fellowship uh, back in the year 2000, 2002, that was when the, uh, you know, BTE behind the ear processors were coming out. I remember it was such a rage. I mean, you really make me think about, it. so I have patients who say, well, you know, my hearing's not that bad. I, I, don't, I don't need to treat it. And they'll always say to me, when, when do you think I should treat it? And I say, yesterday, right? <laughs> The answer is, is, is there's not a little bit of hearing loss, right? It's a, yeah. or there's not a little bit of high blood pressure. People shouldn't wait. And it's interesting because people don't wait for the newest computer. They just buy it. And then they realize that the next model will come out whenever and they'll upgrade to it or iPhone, right? People are, they're jumping on the new stuff. So yeah, that's really, really true. And, and the technology just has continued to improve. The devices themselves have gotten smaller. Um, the first two devices that I had were, were boxes that I would wear on my waist with a, with a wire that came up through my clothes. Um, and you know what? I didn't care because I didn't hear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And so you, you are at the uh, ACIA, right? The American Cochlear Implant Alliance. And so that was a nascent organization that you helped uh, take from uh, being a little baby to growing up to a big adult. How long has it been around? Um, so we were actually um, incorporated uh, in late 2011, and we really got off the ground in 12, um, which is when the board was formed and we, you know, started to have a website. And I was hired and started in November of 12. Um, so it was at that point that we, you know, did a strategic plan and figured out what it was we were going to try to focus on. Um, and we've really taken off since that time. We have, um, from, I think when I came, we had about 85 members. Um, and now we have almost 2,500 members. So essentially we are, have grown into an organization, both for clinicians like yourself, Dr. Sims, but now we've added, um, adults who have cochlear implants, family members, parents of children, advocates, um, a whole range of individuals who care about this technology. Um, and we have actually networks just for um, those consumers and parents to participate in and advocate for uh, expansion and access to cochlear implants. So we're really excited about, you know, all of us working together in one place. Yeah, we all want great things, which is great hearing, right? And so we're all aligned in terms of what we want for ourselves, our family members, our loved ones, or our patients, or our community members. We all want great hearing. Right, exactly. And we want to have access to great hearing. Right. So that's a big part of what we work on in terms of um, the insurance coverage, in terms of what government's doing, in terms of people knowing about it, in terms of asking for referrals, both from uh, hearing healthcare providers and primary care physicians. That's a 
big focus for us right now is ensuring that a primary care doctor knows at what point he should encourage, he or she should encourage a patient to explore a cook plan. No, that's great. And so over the past uh, decade, so what are some of the wonderful milestones? I'm sure there are a lot. And remember, we don't have, you know, seven hours. So let's hit the highlights because I know there's like so much great stuff the ACIA has done. But how about some of the highlights? Because you're looking at your 10th birthday, essentially. And so what are the first 10 years? What are, what are some of the highlights? So a lot of what we're trying to do and have been trying to do for a few years is, is focus on audiologists who are not in the CI world. The individuals who are feeding uh, hearing aids on people and who don't necessarily know when they should refer. So we spend a lot of time on that. This morning, we gave actually uh, a course um, on one of our partner organizations, Audiology Online, um, and it was given by a surgeon and an audiologist together because we really tried to have people um, with different roles within that continuum right. to provide that kind of information. And it's on how we determine candidacy. And the board took this on because we felt that candidacy determination is done differently by different centers. And as a consequence, access is affected depending upon where the patient goes in to get evaluated. Um, so same criteria, you know, same indications for the device. Um, but different ways of evaluating candidacy. So we're looking at that in terms of four populations. So the, the talk that we gave today um, was on adults with bilateral deafness. Um, we'll do the same children with bilateral deafness. And then we'll be also talking about single-sided deafness in adults and children. And that's a, you know, that's a big area that has exploded recently because when I first got into this field, we didn't use cochlear implants on people oh. who had, had um, you know, he hearing on, on one side, good hearing on one side. So uh, what we've learned over time is it has a huge effect on a child's ability to function in a classroom setting. And we've known that for a long time. There's been work that's been done for years that have shown that children, even with a mild to moderate unilateral hearing loss that's untreated, will have a one third chance of failing one grade. So think about changing that to not mild to moderate, but profound on that yeah. other side. Yeah. So huge effect for children. And adults also have a lot of difficulty negotiating in the world with one with one cochlear implant, depending on who they are. People are, are different about it. I've been talking to a man in, 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 in the neighborhood who uh, lost his hearing on one side. And, he just cannot function. He's having difficulty uh, communicating in a restaurant, uh, figuring out where sound is coming from. He's just so frustrated. Um, and he's using a technology called a cross hearing aid, which sends the sound from his ear where he's not hearing over to his other side. So he's plugging up his good ear uh, with an ear mold to receive that sound, which for him is not really helpful. So he's a perfect candidate for a cochlear implant for his single sided deafness. So that whole approach of really looking at it, not from a bilateral analysis standpoint, but from each ear standpoint, you know, and I think one of the things that we're really emphasizing is, you know, with our sight or our knees or our hips, if somebody has a problem on one side, we don't say, oh, you got a normal knee on the other side. You have a normal hip on the other side. You have a normal eye on the other side. So we're only going to worry about that. But it, it's only been in hearing where we had this approach where we evaluated people bilaterally for a cochlear implant. And we really want to move away from that. And we want to evaluate people for each ear, each side. Um, so that's something we've been talking about. Yeah, no, that's definitely kind of the current trend in terms of figuring out where it is and, you know, really figuring it out, right? I mean, um, from a clinical practice point of view, it's how to fit those patients and do them right. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm a person who's tried and pushed a lot of these technologies and figuring out where that line is in terms of where to do it, and where not to, it just takes time for the community to figure all that out. 
Right. And, and each person actually needs to be evaluated individually. Right. It's not the case that there's a one size fits all approach to doing this. And so I think that's also part of what we're doing is really trying to make it patient centered, which, you know, is the big hot word right now. Everybody's talking about things being patient centered. Um, so but that's true. It should be done in that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, that, 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 I mean, I, I mean, not for anything, but I think our center has always been patient centered, uh, you know, really kind of looking at the individual needs and how we can fit people. Um, it, it's hard, though, because, you know, there's different levels of sophistication and, and different levels of understanding and different levels of willingness to invest themselves in understanding what they're getting themselves into. So. Right, exactly. I, I totally agree. So in terms of that, and so that that's awesome. You're doing that in terms of on the uh, legislative coverage front, what, what's been going on in that world? So um, something that just happened this week that we've been working on for seven years is wow. um, hopefully a change in the criteria that are used by CMS to evaluate whether somebody who is a Medicare beneficiary may receive a cook through implant. And in the past, um, people who were Medicare beneficiaries uh, had to be more deaf. And, you know, that's this will be, if we get this, this will be the second time since I've been in this field that we've, that we've moved the needle on those criteria, those candidacy criteria. Um, and of course, we know we don't want people um, to be having difficulty for a longer period of time. We know we want to bring them along because we've seen it in the younger population and we know in people who are 65 who have gotten cooked their implants uh, with more residual hearing and shorter duration of deafness that they've done really well. So we had to demonstrate that with a study and then publish that study in JMA, which we did, um, and then go back to Medicare and try to convince them to go ahead and change the candidacy criteria and so we do we did find out this week on monday that there is what they call a national coverage determination or ncd that has been published and we will be going in and encouraging people all over the country to write in about these proposed new criteria and what that means and why they're important and what it means, not only for that Medicare population of people, but also the effect that it has on younger populations because insurance and Medicaid and other insurance vehicles look at Medicare. Medicare is what we call the gold standard. So everybody looks at Medicare and then they develop criteria based on what Medicare does. So if Medicare is being very strict about who it's going to allow in, it also affects people of all age groups, including children. So, so what's the evolution? You get it, this national coverage determination, right? So that's a published uh, determination. And so then what's the problem? Because you're saying that we need to continue to advocate. What do we need to do to get that? That that sounds like it's not codified yet. There are things we need to do to get it to become more. It's, it's a process. It takes about six months. And so yeah. We um, organizationally will put in comments and we'll be encouraging uh, our members and um, individuals and um, companies that make cochlear implants, um, the whole range of people involved in the community to write comments in on their experience. So it's open for public comment right now before it gets adopted. Is that the correct? It's in the for comment period. 30 days from, uh, from, I guess it was Monday that it opened. So okay. it's 30 days. So we all have 30 days to put in comments to support what's being proposed. Then what happens is, is CMS looks at those comments and they say, OK, are these comments supporting what is being proposed in terms of the change? OK, yeah. and then it'd be hard pressed to think anybody's going to oppose it. I, I don't think it's a matter of opposing it. I oh, think okay. it's how strong the case is that uh, we, that we make. Um, you know, and, and that and that's really important is that we make a strong case, you know, and as a community, we come together and we say, you know, these are the reasons why I think or we think well, this is an important change to make in the indications. Um, so we, we will definitely be pursuing that and encouraging it. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's something 
that I personally think has taken way too long to move the needle on. Um, but we, we are working on that. Another um, initiative that we became involved in um, is the FDA recently had um, a workshop on cochlear implants first, I think. Um, and it was a two day workshop that they had at the beginning of that. Yeah. And we participated in that. Um, we were pretty hard on the MTA. Um, you know, we, we talked about the, um, the fact that the indications that the FTA has an effect, particularly for children, um, poses great problems for patients um, in terms of getting insurance coverage. So, for example, right now, for the uh, indication from, for single-sided deafness in a child, if you look at the FTA indication, um, a child may not get an, an, a cochlear implant for single-sided deafness until they're five years old. And mm. that, makes, so that doesn't help congenitally deaf and single sided deaf, right? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, likewise, the um, FDA indications for a child who's between the ages of two and 17 must miss 70% of words and sentences before they're considered a candidate. Wow. So, uh, really uh, worse discrimination. Yeah, a younger child can be considered. Um, with with much broader indications, so it's just it's just the wacky way that this process has evolved. And well, I will say though, historically, we did not do a good job of actually defining what single sided deafness was, if that makes sense. And so we're kind of being forced to as a community to define it. I'm not saying there's not a lot of inconsistencies, but we will have to define what it actually is. Right, but I think that what we were talking about at that workshop is that the way the FDA um, puts together its criteria affects access. Right, I'll agree a thousand percent, yes, yes. And, it, and, it, and if, you, if, if a patient goes into a center uh, where the clinicians know how to negotiate that process with insurers, if they're, you know, if they're savvy about it and they've done it a lot, chances are they'll get the person through. But let's just say that person's in a small town in South, whatever, you know, in a, in a rural area with a clinic that doesn't do a lot of cochlear implants and someone who perhaps doesn't have the same relationships with insurers that they won't necessarily make it through. So, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, this is what happens with all new indications and in technology, right? There are people who kind of, and so... It is true rather than just, well, it's approved. We have data that demonstrates we should approve this. You then have to go through a whole nother rigmarole to then prove to the insurance companies, despite the FDA saying it, that it meets it, right? Because they will push back and say it's experimental and it becomes very, very onerous to do that work. Right. And if the FDA's indication doesn't say what you think it should be as a physician, right. Then you've got to say you're that as a clinician, you know that this child is going to do better with it, or this adult is going to do better with this, um, and you're prescribing it off label, which of course you can do. Um, it's more work to get it paid for, frankly. It's very it's very onerous. It is. So so we 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 actually had an interesting opportunity with the FDA on this, and we're actually talking to the FDA about maybe they should they should develop these indications in a different way than they've been doing in the past, which is basically based on what the CI companies put in. It's a well, it also seems like, I, mean, I could be wrong, that the study design drives the indications. In other words, how do we get enough data together to be able to get approval without getting dinged? And so they create that corpus of data and then that creates... So I mean, Baja is a perfect example, right? The bone anchored hearing aid has, has, is indicated no less than five years old, right? And that's just because the data, and that happens in Arizona. There are kids who have single-sided deafness. They're wearing a headband for four and a half years of their life because the insurance company says we won't pay for it till they're five, but you know they're going to go to a surgical intervention and convert it from a headband to an implant 
at that time. So you're right. It makes no sense because you know they're going to go to it anyway. But on the flip side, it's very hard to overcome when the FDA says five, they'll say, well, that's outside of FDA criteria. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, I think a lot of what we're doing is trying to negotiate those hurdles. Um, and so some of those hurdles exist in uh, some of the uh, larger insurers um, right. that uh, have just decided that they're not going to cover for this reason or that reason or this indication or that. Um, and so I think for the first time, we're going to try to do some very robust advocacy directly with some of those larger insurers. That's um, good. And educate yeah. patients to understand that, unfortunately, the product matters, right? So it's not just who gives you the cheapest premium or teaching them also. The thing that I always teach them is to go back to their HR people because that's where they can really help is when they're shopping people who work for employers, when they're shopping for these insurance policies, if they want something covered, they need to advocate to their HR people that it's covered. Exactly. And I think we also can involve our patient community um, in getting the word out to newspapers and media about, uh, I won't name names today, but uh, some Maybe of the insurance companies, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they don't, you know, they're not going to like that negative press coming out. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's also part of what we're working on. Um, you know, I think, and the other thing that I'm personally very interested in is, is the way um, popular culture portrays deafness hmm. and some of the confusion that ensues because of the way that's done. Um, so my, my personal current, not so much current because it, it started, it was late 2020 when the film Sound of Metal came out. Did you see that film? I did, yes. Yeah. So Sound of Metal um, had a lot of erroneous information in it about going there in months. Um, and because it was a film that was nominated for uh, an Academy Award, um, and it came out at a, at a time in our lives when we were all watching a lot of movies online, um, you know, a lot of people saw it. And it provided a lot of negative perceptions about cochlear implants, including um, the, the statement that they're not covered by insurance. And the whole storyline for that film was based on the fact that the central character had to basically sell everything to, to pay for his cochlear implant because it wasn't covered by insurance, which was just utterly ridiculous. Right. And, and the, the writer and producer of it knew darn well that what he was doing. I, I, I had conversations with him. Um, and it was just the negativity was just all through the film. Well, you know, as you know, the Academy members, they're voting on the artistic, not the uh, authenticity of it. So they're not going to fact check it either. Right. So it's kind of right. a process. Right, right, right. right. And um, one of the things that made surgeons crazy about that film um, was the, the surgical scars um, that they demonstrated for uh, the central character, these huge J-shaped surgical scars. And people saw it with ah. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so um, it was really designed to inject a lot of negativism about cochlear implants. And, you know, I think people don't realize the extent to which that affects the population of people that just don't walk into your clinic, Dr. Sims. They and don't they just don't want the surgery and things like that, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and fear of the surgery is a reason that people don't go forward after they determine that they're probably a candidate. So there's those, those kind of two things that go on. People have to learn that they're a candidate. They have to be referred in. And secondly, for some patients, they learn they're a candidate and they, they, they don't go forward for a whole bunch of different silly, re I think, silly reasons. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, uh, I have multiple patients who I've asked that question and they'll look me dead and they say, they're crazy, get the surgery. I mean, it's an hour outpatient surgery that cuts like two inches behind your ear. I mean, you know, patients who know or are interested in knowing, it, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal, but I, I get it how pop culture can uh, certainly make it a scary undertaking. Yeah. You know, and I think the other thing people worry about is because we're doing surgeries on people now who have some residual hearing, yeah. uh, which was not so much the case when I had my 
go through that 1992. I mean, in that in that at that time frame, you had to be pretty deaf to get a CI. Um, and I think investigated condition of eye was got about four percent of words and census, which let's face it, that's guessing. That's that's nothing. That was good um, luck. You knew one word. You got baseball. <laughs> <laughs> that I could do. <laughs> or hot dog, right? One of those two. <laughs> uh, but but I think people now sometimes come to this with 20 or 30 percent words and sentences. And so they say, I don't want to lose what I have. Um, and not thinking about the fact that they're going to probably go from 20 or 30 percent to 80 to 90 um, percent yeah. very, very quickly. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that we have difficulty overcoming. I don't want to lose my natural hearing or this is the end of the line. You know, it's, you know, it's some of this kind of thinking that exists and they may not even come into your clinic because they, that's what's in their head. You know? No, it's true. I mean, you know, um, one of the other things I, I, as I practice more and more, I don't think people are very good at perceiving how bad their hearing is to the extent that, you know, using speech reading and context skills and things like that. People who like when you were at 4% in an ideal one-on-one, you probably communicated pretty well with lip reading. And so oh, it's hard. Right, no, <laughs> I was, I, I, it was, I was exhausted all the time. I'm not underestimating yeah. the work of it, but it's the inability to appreciate how hearing impaired you are because you think it's happening in your head. I had a woman today say, you know, I'm just wor- I'm worn out by three or four o'clock. I said, yeah, because your hearing's so terrible. Your speech reading and your, your brain's just tired. She's like, oh, that makes sense. So people don't even realize how hard they're working. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the things that was really funny when I was going, starting to think about this, um, my husband and I remember how, I would, you know, you're talking in the dark when you're, before you go to sleep and the lights are out. And I would say, oh, I can hear better when the lights are on. <laughs> right. Well, people say, I can hear better when you're looking at me. Well, you can lip read a lot better when I'm looking at you, right? But I didn't realize what I was doing. Right, right. I, I didn't, I could, I could hear better when the, light, when the lights are on. <laughs> it's like there was some magic about the lights. Right. I didn't realize what I was doing. Exactly. Uh, so it, it's a, to, to, you know, to agree with your point is that people don't necessarily realize all of the things that they're doing to be able to hear. And some of these, um, some of these people that, you know, they're using an FM system and they're using captioning and they have a dog and they have, you know, remote microphones that they point at you and, um, and, they, and they're working so hard to get every scrap of language that's coming in. And it's exhausting. To well, you, you know, so, so the analogy I use, Donna, is and so because it's visual, if you lost a leg, right, and you were going up the sidewalk, up and up, hopping up and down on one foot, you could get around, right? You could do almost anything but you're going to be exhausted. But the other interesting thing is, is other people would look at you and say, you really should get an artificial leg, right? But because hearing loss is invisible, nobody looks at you and says, you should do something about it. But it's the same. Like these people are essentially going without an artificial leg. They're hopping up and down on one foot from a hearing point of view. And, and so the, the artificial leg is not going to get, make you an Olympian. You're not going to go win the hurdles. But it's certainly going to make your life a heck of a lot better. And that's what I think cochlear implant is for people is, is it's a, it's a rehabilitative technology that is awesome. As you attest, I mean, look at all the stuff you're doing. You've run two other organizations. You've worked in the private sector in between. You're now running another organization. You're changing policy for cochlear implants. I mean, all because you got it. I mean, not you got it. You actually physically got the cochlear implant. It's profound. And what it's helped everybody else. It's amazing. Like, this is the cochlear implant that's ever helping everybody else get a cochlear implant. Yeah. And you know what? I moved through that process really quickly uh, because I realized how hard it was for me to do anything. I really thought I was going to have to reinvent my life. You know, it just it had become so impossible to socialize, to do my work. And I was in a totally different field at the time. Some people were very accommodating, but this was also before the ADA, so there were no accommodations going on. And the other thing that people don't realize is what an incredible difference the internet has made for those of us with hearing loss, because it puts me on a level 
playing field with everybody else. Everybody's using texting. You know, everybody's using email. Everybody's using the internet. Um, but I didn't have any of that. I mean, I, I didn't have any way to communicate. You know, and it was it was before email. Just think about that. A deaf person trying to get along with without email. Well, I remember the hearing impaired patients were the first ones that had that sidekick, if you remember that. Like, they were ahead of everybody else because it made their lives so much easier. They were all on them because it was like, wow, we can actually interact easily. So it, it is wonderful. Uh, all this technology and handheld smartphones have definitely made life better. But you also want to hear, obviously. Right. And, and, and the other thing that I think it has happened is because we use texting so much, some of our patients who get cochlear implants don't learn to use the phone. Agreed. And I really, really urge them from a very early age for children and for adults who have perhaps haven't used the phone in five or 10 years um, to, to practice. It takes practice. It takes getting over your fear of not of getting it wrong or being right. embarrassed um the phone's a little bit complicated because you're 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 getting a signal from the phone so you have to figure out how you can get the best signal from the phone right. um, you have to figure out if you need to make adjustments in the sound that's going into your ear from your sound processor and then you have to figure out how you're going to connect between your sound processor and the telephone so that's three sets of things you have to think about. And sometimes people can just hold the phone up to their ear and they're fine. Um, and I can do that, but I prefer to use my Bluetooth to go from my processor to the phone, just like you do, just like everybody with normal right. hearing does. Um, so those kinds of advances that have uh, been accepted into the general population, we now have available to us. Um, well, it's absolutely wonderful. It really is. And so what, where do you see things like what, what's the immediate uh, tackle ahead of you? What's the immediate challenge right now that you see upcoming that you guys are going to wrestle for, with? For cochlear implants? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like all the stuff with single-sided deafness and uh, indication sounds like where you're really concentrating on. I think it's still awareness. Uh, you know, I, think know. It's, I think it's people still not getting referred in, um, even from hearing healthcare providers, because most of our patients are wearing hearing aids. Right, that's true. And Although I saw one today, he didn't. He told me he wanted to do everything to get his hearing better. And I said, but you don't wear hearing aids. <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but, but, but that should be going on and it's not going on to the extent that it is. And I, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's a set of factors. I think it's, um, you know, it, people who fit hearing aids probably don't realize how well these work. Um, they probably don't know at what point they should be encouraging somebody to move over to this. Um, and sometimes there's a conflict of interest because they want to keep the patient. Um, you know, so that's an issue. I also think that within the primary care setting, um, we're just not training people um, in medical school about hearing loss. So Agreed. I mean, that, 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 that extends all the way up the spectrum. I mean, even to mild to moderate hearing losses. I mean, it's a chronically untreated and poorly treated entity, which I appreciate everybody working on this because it needs to be changed. Yeah. So here's a true story. Um, my mom, uh, she passed away a few years ago, but uh, two years before she died, uh, she was um, in the hospital at George Washington University Hospital in Washington um, being treated for pneumonia. Very, you know, common thing that happens to older people. And she went in very, very sick. So she was actually in the hospital for one month. Oh. And so um, she was assigned, someone was assigned, I should say, a fourth year medical student was assigned to track her, you know, and see how she progressed over time. So one day I went over to visit her when she was still in the hospital. And the, med the medical student was there in her room waiting for her. And I said, um, Jessica. So have you had your uh, segment yet on hearing loss? And she said, yes. And I said, and did you learn about cochlear implants? And she said, no, but your mother told me that you had one. So now I know all about them. 
<laughs> I, I just tell you, in my medical school curriculum, uh, a half a class was dedicated to the ear. One half of an hour. So. Isn't that amazing? Well, yes, it is. And so, I mean, that's an advocacy issue too with our academic colleagues. So th th this has been great, Donna. I have a couple of questions for you. One is, is uh, what's your favorite sound? I love asking people this. So, you know, there's so many sounds that I love. I can tell you about a sound that I heard for the first time with my fifth cochlear implant. Okay. So, the external processor. Yes, my my fifth yeah. external sound processor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, where we live, we have some owls in the back of our property. And I never heard the owls. And, and my son, who was so anxious for me to get acquainted with all the sounds in my environment, he was always pointing out sounds. And usually I could hear them. Um, but he, would, he was always telling me, okay, there it is. Did you hear it? And I'd say no. And then when I got my fifth, it might have been the sixth. I'd have to go back and count. But one, you know, one of my sound processors that had a larger grab of sound than the prior right. ones had had. Um, for the first time, I heard the sound of the owl, and I remembered it because I had had nearly normal hearing as a child. So I remembered what a, what a, what an owl sounded like, and so I heard that sound. And he was with me, and I said. Is that the owl? And he said, yes, mama. <laughs> you know? That's so, awesome, right? Because it shows you the incremental improvements that these processors have done, right? That version four, you weren't able to hear the owl and version five, you were. And that's a very specific experience. That's really wonderful. That's great. Yeah, it, it was really cool. And, it, and I think what was different for me with that particular processor was it, it enabled me to hear something that was actually pretty far away. Oh, yeah, because, you know, that's a subtle sound, you know, you and, and you're not prepared for it either. It just happens and then it goes away. So it's a little bit different than correlating a sound with an action, like a door closing or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's a cool sound that I remember. That that, I that's really wonderful. So uh, today we have Donna Sorkin. She's the executive director of the ACIA, which is the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. Donna, if people wanted to get a hold of you or contact you or learn more, how, how would they do that? Well, the best thing to do would be to come to our website, which is www.acialliance.org. And we have just so much information for uh, the general audience, as well as for hearing healthcare professionals and physicians. Um, we have a lot of primary care doctors that end up on our site. So we have actually a portal just for primary care doctors, but a lot of, a lot of information we've talked about insurance today. So there's um, a lot of information on insurance. We have stories about people of different ages. Um, we have a help aspect. So if you have questions, you can send something into the helpline and send it in that way. Um, but we really have tried to design the website to really help the general public um, about cochlear implants and just everything they need to know about cochlear implants. So um, come to our website. We also have Facebook and Twitter. And we put a lot of uh, social media information out about, um, you know, what we're working on and things that we hope people will um, be interested in. So you can follow us on Facebook and on Twitter and get information that way as well. So um, we really want you to have everything you need to know about cochlear implants. Yeah, I'd agree. It's a wonderful uh, resource. I've, I send my patients there to learn more about it. I think it's great. And I think it's a great advocacy uh, organization. So again, we have Donna Sorkin here. She's the executive director of the ACA. Donna, thank you so much for uh, coming on. It's great to see you. It's been a while since we've seen each other. Uh, due to the pandemic, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.